Um, this is, you know, me talking to you, sharing my story. Oh shoot, I wasn't filming. <laughs> Classic. Well, I'm not gonna redo that. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hi everybody. We have gotten so many questions about this trip. What is it? How long is it? What are you doing? So we're just gonna do a video to cover. Okay, a little bit about background. So Ryan and I travel, that's a fact. Um, and so of course it's, it's no surprise that we're trying to figure out what our next bucket list adventure is or what's a lifetime experience would be. Um, and in 2019, we said, you know what? Maybe we'll do Kilimanjaro because that sounds pretty cool and it's reasonable, it's doable. Um, but then life happened, 2020 happened. Honestly, thought that was gonna be the end to our adventure, you know, our, our summoning a peak, if you will. And so that was that. But then sometime last year in 2021, we started, you know, going down this rabbit hole of YouTube videos of Everest Base Camp, Everest Base Camp, and, you know, getting to know a bit more of the region and all of its treks, like the, the three passes and, Gokyori and, and Island Peak, I guess you could say that's that. Then we just kind of started doing research and you know, it started off not so serious, but then the more it happened, it get, the more it got serious. And here we are today and it's very serious. It's, it's happening, it's soon. Coming up in a few weeks, we'll be off the grid doing just that. So what is that exactly? Let me have Ryan show you. He was better at this stuff. I'm terrible with maps. He loves maps. Know your strengths. <laughs> but anyways, let's uh, let's jump in. As the only one in this couple who can find their way out of a paper bag, I'm gonna be showing you where we're gonna be going and exactly what we're gonna be doing there. So, well, actually, it's probably easier if I just show you. But first, let's have a quick and fun geography lesson. For those not familiar with the region, the collision of the Indian tectonic plate with what is now Tibet uplifted the ground several miles over the course of about 50 million years, forming the Tibetan Plateau and the great mountain ranges of South and Central Asia. In particular, the Himalayan Karakoram ranges contain the vast majority of peaks above 6,000 meters and are the only places in the world where mountains over 8,000 meters can be found, of which there are 14. So let's zoom in and take a quick tour to familiarize ourselves with these peaks. Starting in on the western end of the Himalayas in northern Pakistan is Nanga Parbat, famous for the views of its imposing Rakyot face seen from Ferry Meadow and is one of the most dangerous 8,000ers to climb due to its unpredictable weather. Heading north to the Karakoram, separated from the Himalayas by the Indus River headwaters, we find the greatest quantity of glaciated water outside the poles and the greatest concentration of 8,000 meter peaks, including Gashabram 1 and 2, Broad Peak, and of course, K2. K2 is the most difficult and dangerous of all the highest peaks to climb, being referred to as the Savage Mountain due to its combination of extreme altitude, exposure, deadly weather, geographic isolation, and technical difficulty. Next, we move east to Nepal, where the Gangetic Plain meets the edge of the Tibetan Plateau. Here we find Dalagiri and Annapurna, separated from one another by the Kali Gandaki Gorge, which due to being between such high peaks is considered to be one of the deepest canyons in the world at almost three and a half miles. Annapurna is another contender for the most dangerous of these peaks to climb due to the extreme steepness and avalanche risk on its 10,000 foot southern face. Meanwhile, its base is home to the world famous Annapurna Circuit Trek, which we unfortunately are not taking this time around. Further to the east is Manaslu, another difficult climb, and an increasingly popular trekking area. The lowest of the 8,000ers, and the only one situated entirely on the Tibetan Plateau, Shisha Pangma is also one of the most inaccessible and was the last to be climbed due to permit restrictions from the Chinese government. Jumping over to the eastern border of Nepal, Kanchenjunga is an absolutely massive mountain rising to 8,586 meters, making it the third tallest in the world 
and easily visible as a picturesque backdrop when visiting the Darjeeling or Sikkim regions of India. Finally, in the Mahalangor section of the Himalayas, including the Sagarmatha National Park, where we will be trekking, we can find four of the six highest mountains in the world. In the northwest is Choyu, considered the quote-unquote easiest of the 8,000ers, as it is mostly a walk-up. But it's still a walk directly into the death zone, where the oxygen levels are too low to support human life for more than a short time, so not really easy. On the eastern side, Makalu, the world's fifth highest mountain, dominates the Makalu Barun National Park, which would be worth a separate trip to the Barun Valley. The centerpiece of the region is the enormous Everest Massif, including Lhotse on the south. It's the fourth highest peak in the world. Lhotse is connected to Everest itself via what is known as the South Coal. The final camp before summit attacks for the majority of expeditions is 8,849 meters or 29,032 feet at its summit. The mountain has been climbed by its remote, steep, technical, and dangerous eastern Kangsheng face, its north face, and via the Kumbu Icefall and South Coal, which is the most accessible route, and well known in recent years for controversy surrounding the commodification of the mountain and overcrowding. Credit to Nims Persia for this now famous photo. Go watch 14 Peaks if you haven't already. All South Coal expeditions start from the Nepalese Everest Base Camp, or EBC, and we will be heading there too as part of our trip. So, how? We have to start in Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. We'll stay here for a couple days after flying in, but before we get too comfortable, we will leave again aboard what is referred to by the travel industry marketing gurus as the world's most dangerous commercial flight. Taking a small 20-person prop plane, we need to fly directly into the mountains in order to land at Lukla Airport. As you can see, the reason for the most dangerous moniker is the extremely short runway and complete lack of space to maneuver in case of a botched landing. Lukla is the real starting point of the trek, and from here, at an elevation of 2,860 meters, we'll set off on foot north through the Chatra Gorge. After climbing almost 600 meters, we arrive at Namche Bazaar, which is the main jumping off point and an acclimatization area for excursions further into the region. We expect to spend two to three days here, taking day hikes to higher elevations, visiting temples and local Sherpa cultural sites. There's also a chance that this may be our last opportunity to take a halfway decent shower. We'll be taking the long way around to reach EBC. Rather than continuing straight north, we'll head northwest up the Bote Koshi Valley gradually gaining an altitude until undertaking a rather steep and grueling climb to 5,340 meters in order to cross the Renjo La Pass, where we hope to get our first direct views of Everest. Below is Gokyo Lake, renowned for its beauty. We'll descend to the lake and Gokyo Village, only to climb right back up Gokyo Ri in order to get unobstructed views of the region. From here, we should be able to see a panorama of, among others, Choyu, Gyakchung Kang, the highest mountain in the world under 8,000 meters, Everest, Nupse, Lhotse, and Makalu. We'll also get impressive closer views of Cholatse. Taboche, Kantega, and Tamserku. Descending back down, we'll need to cross directly over Ngozumpa Glacier, the longest in the Himalayas, and descend the other side in order to cross Chola Pass. Once through, we'll follow the base of Lubuche Peak in order to join the trail along the Kumbu Glacier, which traces all the way back to the western Kum Valley separating Everest and Lhotse, making it the highest glacier in the world. Passing underneath Pumori, we'll arrive at EBC during the beginning of the expedition season, 
so may have the good fortune of seeing some serious adventurers hoping to tackle the summit of Everest itself. The top of Everest is actually obscured when standing at EBC, so we'll backtrack to a nearby ridge known as Kalapatar at the base of Pumo Ri in order to get the closest look at the mountain we can expect. Thus ends the first major objective of the trek, and from this point forward, we turn our focus to reaching the summit of Island Peak. We'll descend back down the glacier towards Dingbokche village. During this part of the trek, we'll get up close views of Amadabla, a steep pyramidal peak sometimes referred to as the Matterhorn of the Himalayas, and considered one of the most beautiful mountains in the world. From Dingbokche, we'll also get our first views of Island Peak itself so-called because the expedition team led by Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay said it resembled an island in a sea of ice when they climbed it as part of a training exercise before their first ever summoning of Mount Everest in 1953. Rendezvousing with the rest of the Island Peak Ascent team at Chukung Village, we'll spend two days at base camp resting and acclimatizing and training for the climb. We'll then move to high camp at 5,600 meters to spend the night so as to have the best chance to succeed when setting out at 2 a.m. the following morning. Traveling across the steep glacier crisscrossed with crevasses, and finally climbing up a 150 meter headwall of ice to reach the summit at 6,189 meters, or 20,305 feet. We're now standing at the same height as the summit of Denali, the highest mountain in North America. But zooming out, you can see how Island Peak is dwarfed by the enormous mountains surrounding us, reminding us that really, at the end of the day, we didn't accomplish anything. But hopefully we won't have fully internalized that reality in the moment, and we will happily and proudly descend the mountain, heading back down the valleys towards civilization. So that's it. Hopefully that clears things up for everyone, and uh, hopefully everything goes according to plan. As you can tell, that is quite a trip. And obviously we're going with a guide. It's very ill-advised to go without a guide, so. How did we choose our guide? Well, we wanted to go with somebody that we could trust, because duh. Also didn't want to manage like a lot of the organization because we're busy and we don't know what we're doing. And we wanted to know we would have the best lodges and food and sleeping situations. And when I say that, that actually sounds very precious, but it's like, I want a place that has like working toilets, shower when possible, heat, <laughs> and good clean food, and um, you know, good night's sleep. That was something that I wasn't gonna budge on. I mean, all those are something I didn't really wanna budge on, but very much a trip of essentials. If you can tell, it's like the bare minimum is if we can just achieve that. Um, we wanted like a local and ethical approach. So we wanted um, that local touch with people who have boots on the ground and know what they're doing. Um, and it's not just something that's outsourced. I also want, you know, someone who understands the needs, expectations, um, and knows how to communicate uh, in the way that we wanted. So definitely need to make sure you're going with the right people for that. <laughs> safety. Safety first. Safety being the extra days to, for example, to acclimatize. So it does mean a couple more days in certain areas, but being able to, to make sure that our body adjusts so then we can take it up to the next level when we go higher in elevation. Um, but also it's things like fixing our own lines. Uh, when we're gonna be doing the Island Peak Summit, I wanna make sure that like, it's not like these old random ropes that I don't know how many people have been used, nobody's chucked them. I mean, when we're gonna be climbing a peak, I definitely need to trust that the rope I literally am trusting with my life is a good one. Uh, obviously safety first. I know I said trust first, but maybe it's safety first. And of course, do whatever within reason, to ensure that we, we accomplish our goal and, and successfully reach the summit, but also get back down because that's the hard part. Um, and so that was really what we were looking for. I mean, like I said, I feel like that's pretty minimal. It's feel like, I feel like that's the, the basics of what you want to achieve in, in any of these trips, but it's also not something that's necessarily always easy to find because there's a, there's a lot of guides out there, so choose wisely, but it's complicated. Um, so anyways, that's how we chose our guide. And so far we've been very happy and I'm looking forward to, to what's coming up. We get a lot of questions and so I'm just gonna answer them here. Do I have a job? Yes. 
Is my job traveling? No. I wish my job was traveling. If you're watching and you can make that happen, sign me up. I'll do it. Literally. Message me. I'm gay. But no, I'm very lucky, I have to say, to have uh, to work with a company that is allowing me like literally one month off the grid. Um, this is something that's, I think, important for us personally and will, uh, yeah, will be one of those moments you don't forget. Um, so for everybody at my company watching this, thank you, honestly. <laughs> Another funny question that we get asked all the time, usually when we're like buying gear and stuff, is where else have you guys climbed? Because they're like super excited by this adventure and what we're telling them about that they're like, wow, okay, where are you going? This is, you know, this is quite intense. Assuming that this like can't be our first trip and it's like, Oh no, this is this is it. This is our first. Where else have we climbed? I mean, okay, recently we did that at Cosme. I mean, I spoke about it in this video. So there's that. Now I can say there's that. But other than that, like, this is a first. We're kind of jumping in uh, full on. But I mean, honestly, how often do you have time to really do these things multiple times? I mean, got to start somewhere and why not? Uh, but we'll see how that goes. Are you afraid? Ryan's not, <laughs> he's very confident. I wish I was more confident. I'm afraid of something silly happening. Like, I don't know. I twist my ankle on day one and have to turn back. Or like, um, there's a bad snowstorm. I mean, that can happen. Or even if we have some contingency days for the summit, like something weird's gonna happen or like, I don't know. Also of how hard it's gonna be. I'm afraid that I didn't prepare enough despite preparing a lot. Not a lot, a good amount though, um, but normal, we're on track. What if um, what if my body doesn't acclimatize well to, to the altitude? I guess I'm afraid of it not going as planned, but to be honest, that's how most of these adventures happen, so I, that's just something I need to accept. I'm not afraid for my life. We have a ton of safety nets in place. We even have helicopter rescue insurance, so like, honestly, knock on wood, but if we need it, like, Everything's set up. It should be fine. I guess I'm just like really wanting to to make this work and to make it to the top. No pressure. I feel like there's this pressure because that's what we're setting up to do. Um, so obviously I want to do it and I'm talking to you guys about it before a lot. So if I don't, I mean, everybody's gonna know, which is fine. I mean, there's no shame. And if, there, if it doesn't happen, there's definitely a reason why it doesn't happen. I'm afraid I'm gonna have the best time of my life and never wanna come back. I'm just kidding. I'll probably wanna come back. I don't wanna be stuck in the mountains. I mean, that's a long time away from civilization, but um, I'm curious, not afraid. I'm curious to see where this is gonna go next. If we do like this, does this mean we're gonna be those people who are gonna be doing mountaineering on, on our, in our free time? Maybe. Honestly, when things are gonna be tough I will definitely be thinking about all you guys and your messages and because I'm sure after you know after that whole time trekking there's gonna be tough days I don't think every day is gonna be easy but it is what it is we'll get there um we'll make it happen we're doing we're doing the necessary preparation so yeah that's that's the trip um getting very excited thank you for watching stay tuned um let me know if you have any questions otherwise I am excited to continue taking you on this adventure with me. You can follow me on Instagram also, that's probably where you're gonna find most of uh, my, you know, day-to-day -day content of what's happening and speak soon. This is all new for us. Um,